most exciting exhibit openings we've ever had at the Clinton Center. I'm Stephanie Street, and I'm the executive director of the William J. Clinton Foundation. Thank all of you for joining us tonight as we open our newest exhibit, Play Ball, the St. Louis Cardinals. This one-of-a-kind exhibit features decades of memorabilia from one of the country's most beloved and certainly one of Arkansas's most beloved sports franchises, the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank some of our partners who helped bring play ball to the Clinton Center. First, the fantastic St. Louis Cardinals organization. Let's give them a big round of applause. Like the team they represent, this organization is truly world class. Specifically, I'd like to thank Ron Waterman, Vicki Bryant, and Paula Holman, who are all with us tonight. Can you stand up and let us recognize them? Thank you appropriately. I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions of John Rogers and his staff and Randy Kaplan. Could you all please stand as well? Thank you. And we have a few very, very special guests in this audience tonight. Sandy Dean and his family. Sandy is the son of St. Louis Cardinal Paul Daffy Dean and nephew of St. Louis Cardinal Dizzy Dean. Please stand up and be recognized and let us thank you. I'd also like to recognize the very lovely Dr. Jackie Brock, head of the Jacqueline Brock Ministry and wife of our honored guest. Jackie, please. And finally, I'd like to extend a very heartfelt thank you to the staff of the Clinton Library. Their dedication to this exhibit has been both personal and professional. And I'm sure you'll not find a bigger Cardinals fan anywhere across the country than the Deputy Director of the Clinton Library, Director, Deputy Director Kurt Sin. Kurt, please stand and let us thank you for your amazing work on this exhibit. Our Kansans have a special affinity for the Cardinals. Since our own minor league team, the Arkansas Travelers, was the AA affiliate for the St. Louis Cardinals from 1966 to 2000. The timing of this exhibit could not be more ideal. Last October, baseball fans had the privilege to watch one of the most exciting World Series championships ever, as the Cardinals captured the title. Yes, as the Cardinals captured the title after the one, one of the most thrilling game sixes in history. Our Kansans shared the joy and pride of watching our team win its 11th World Series championship. We are beyond thrilled that one of the Cardinals' most decorated players is with us here tonight. And this legendary Cardinal also calls Arkansas his native state. Mr. Lou Brock's career spanned more than 20 years, 17 of those playing for the St. Louis Cardinals. He is the National League's all-time leader with 938 stolen bases. In 1978, the National League announced that its annual stolen base leader would receive the Lou Brock Award, making Brock the first active player to have an award named after him. And although he couldn't be here himself tonight, let me tell you, President Clinton is thrilled to have this exhibit here and shares all of our enthusiasm. Here's what he had to say about our honored guest. I'm proud to welcome my friend Lou Brock back to Arkansas, and I'm so honored that he is opening the latest exhibit at the Clinton Presidential Center.
His accomplishments on the field are both historic and legendary and are surpassed only by his ongoing efforts as one of baseball's greatest ambassadors. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the Clinton Presidential Center, Lou Brock. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, this is like game seven. <laughs> but before I get started, I'd like to thank all of you who showed up here tonight, especially the Clinton Foundation and Museum for their hospitality, inviting us, Cardinal Nation, especially my wife and I, as part of this. It is not very often that a museum in a different city, who is also part of Cardinal Nation, to have a museum of this stature, and that is to have the Cardinal's artifacts, things that you would not see outside of St. Louis, but because of the bridging of the gap and the relationship between the state and Cardinal Nation, we find that it can happen here as well, and we are proud of that. I'd like to thank the people from the state of Arkansas for your hospitality. I uh, welcome us back. When I say us, my wife and I. I uh, was born in the state of Arkansas, actually grew up in Louisiana, called El Dorado, Arkansas, just a few miles <laughs> south of here. And as a youngster, I played a great deal of baseball around Arkansas, Crossett, and also Lake Village, Arkansas. How many know what Lake Village is? Yeah. Lake Village was actually my first game I ever played baseball. There was this picnic in, in the playground area. My team from Colleston, Louisiana, were playing Lake Village. And then about the third or fourth inning, they put in a kid, about 12 years old, to pitch for Lake Village. And the crowd began to chant, schoolboy is now pitching. And everybody rushed to this area, and I'm the bad boy for my team, and schoolboy is out there winding up. He's like your grandfather, Dizzy Dean, throwing a fastball, and nobody was hitting him. And then suddenly somebody looked at me, and I was 12 years old, and they said, uh, why don't you get in there and match schoolboy? So I saw schoolboy wind up and throw a ball. I got in the game, and schoolboy and I pitched no-hit ball for about five innings. <laughs> My team was certain that they had found a great pitcher. The next practice, the next game I got in, I threw every ball way up on the screen, and they said, this kid is no pitcher. <laughs> so therefore, that was my entree into baseball, but it was a love affair because schoolboy was showing the way, and I was part of it. Uh, the Cardinal Museum, what you're going to see here, is some of the most interesting things in Cardinal history. You're going to go back to... Probably 1892, I believe, is when the Cardinals came into existence. And since then, it's been in the partnership with all of the South. The South was uh, all consummated through a radio station called KMOX. How many heard KMOX? I, too, as a kid, used to lay... Listen to the radio late at night. In fact, didn't even listen to the radio. You actually saw baseball on the radio. You could see the Harry Carey pitch when he said, there's a drive. Man, you're looking out. You want to get there and you want to be there. And at the same time, you knew you couldn't because mom would walk in and say, cut the radio off. <laughs> that wasn't a good thing. But I tell you, we could dream and we did. 
And one other thing about baseball, it has a way of letting us escape the reality of the moment. No matter how depressed you are, baseball allow us to escape, I call it, to the toy department of life. You ever taken a kid to a store and he get lost from you? Where do you find him? Toy department. He's in the toy department, and he's got these cars, and he's going vroom, vroom. And so baseball has been that to us. All of us who grew up around baseball, we are looking forward to opening day, which happened in April every year. And then for the next six months, seem as though there is this noise level in America called baseball. You don't have to be there to know what's going on. All you know, there is this level of baseball. It is background music to our lives. And then come October, this is where stars are born, legends are born. This is September, you're on the big stage, and things begin to happen. We saw it this year. David Freeze uh, walked out on the big stage, made a name for himself. And throughout time, that has always happened. Even in my personal uh, career, it was October that made the difference. We played against the Yankees in 64. I had a good World Series, about at 300. We beat the Yankees, and that's all Cardinal Nation cared about, to beat the Yankees. <laughs> it didn't care about how and when. And that's almost, when you, when you think about it, the Cardinal First World Series and I believe in 1926, help me out, the historian, 1926, the World Series ended with Babe Ruth. The Cardinal won. And the big question is, Babe Ruth, why was that significant to the Cardinal win? And what was it about Babe Ruth that caused you to remember, remember that he made the last out in 1926? Does, does anyone know what Babe Ruth did to make the last out? <laughs> Trying to steal second. He thought it was Lou Brock. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> he tried to steal second. Now, can you imagine that? Babe Ruth trying to steal second. Wow. But nevertheless, he did. And so now all of us here in Cardinal Territory, I really love what we see with the Cardinals. They're a team that do not beat themselves. When I was a Cub and playing the Cardinals, the one thing you had to remember, playing St. Louis, you had to get a good night rest. The reason was there were a team, and still is a team, that will not beat themselves. You got to beat them. You got to bring your A game to the field. Anytime you show up at your B game, Cardinals are going to win. And so we always wanted to bring, quote, your A game to the fans. The fans didn't ask you to bring your A game, but they demanded that you do. All of you who are Cardinal fan always wanted to have that bragging right to walk out of the stadium and say, my team gave it best. They didn't beat themselves. And now we had bragging rights for the next day, for the next 24 hours, bragging rights. And as a Cub, when I used to come in and play th this Cardinal ball club, man, you're hoping Bob Gibson was not the pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> and that Bob Euchre would be the catcher. <laughs> <laughs> but it was never the case. Gibson is on the mound, a carver behind the plate. And so they had the best, seemingly though, at all time, going against you. And so I started out to tell you earlier that I had met President Clinton once upon a time. I should like to share with you the first time I ever met him. I was in the city of Seattle on about the 20th floor, walked out of my door, and there were secret service all on the floor. So how do you know a secret service? They all have a scar across the forehead, <laughs> and they have a button on their collar. So I recognized that right away, and I walked over to them, they were going to the elevator, 
And I said, um, how do I get a pen like that? <laughs> and they said, you must be a member of the Secret Service, Mr. Brock. How do you know my name? <laughs> I was told we, we, we know everybody in the hotel. So then we on this elevator going down. And so I said, can I ask a dumb question? Why are you guys here? They said, we're not supposed to tell you, but um, we're here with President Clinton. I go, wow, President Clinton, born in Arkansas. I was born in Arkansas. Can you guys arrange that we can meet? And I'm asking a secret service this, but I'm excited about this. <laughs> and lo and behold, they said, yes, hold on. We get on the walkie-talkie, and they made connection. They turned to me and said, here's what's going to happen. We get to the, uh, uh, the lobby. Out of the elevator, we're going to come, and we're going to walk through these people. There will be about 2,000 people in this lobby. And as we walk through towards them, they're going to part like the Red Sea. <laughs> and I, oh, boy, this is great. So I'm walking behind Secret Service, parting like the Red Sea. And we get out to the limousine, and the president had on his jogging outfit going jogging. And he... They introduce us, he gets out of the car, and lo and behold, I am now looking up. I didn't realize he was that big. <laughs> and now I didn't know what to say except, Mr. President, Mr. President, I'm from Arkansas, da 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 ba da 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 <laughs> And so uh, we, we struck up a relationship, and the next time I had the opportunity to meet him, he asked for an autographed ball. And I didn't have one. I said, well, Mr. President, how do we do this? He said, well, I'm going to be in St. Louis in such a, such a day and just bring the baseball. And it's okay. Let me make a deal with you. I'll bring the baseball provided you brought, sign one for me. He said, it was a deal. He was at this high school on the third level, Jack and I in the middle of the crowd, and he's tall looking over, and he spots us, and he goes, hey, come on. And we go, oh, boy, that's the president telling us to come on. <laughs> so we, we thought we now are the only people in the crowd because we're running through the crowd trying to get to security with the baseballs. And as we got to security, reality hit. You got to go through security. And first thing he said to me, sir, the baseball, they don't ask you any questions. Oh, you want them to get to know your name. Baseball, please. Gave him the baseball. The dogs came up and sniffed the ball. <laughs> I go, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that they do that. <laughs> they do that, they do that. And finally we got to him. I had six baseballs in there signed, and he signed six. And therefore, we were blood brothers the rest of the way. <laughs> so having said all of that, it is still back to the museums, back to cardinals, back to all those things that we know. We also know that in Cardinal territory, Cardinal nation, we find that it is generational. Nowhere, everywhere I go, I see father, son, grandson. That's how they speak to me. This is my father. This is my son. This is my grandson. It seems to be no matter where we go. A few years ago, I was in Denver, Colorado. There was a kid got on a Mark McGuire uniform. And he's twirling the bat like Mark McGuire. And the grandfather said, this is my grandson. McGuire is the favorite player. I said, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. So I said to the kid, who is your favorite player? Mark McGuire. Who is your favorite old-time Cardinals? He said, Arthur Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I got a problem. I'm not going to ask him the other question. <laughs> because I was just like 18 years after I played it. <laughs> I am not going to ask that question. And so you see the dirtiest thing around the country in your travel, uh, especially when you get the word Hall of Fame attached to your name. For whatever reason, they think you were born with it. But it come about because of your exploits and things that you may have done well on the field and compared to others. My wife and I was in Denver the other day. And all of you who have watched baseball and talked baseball, 
I bet you had never heard what I'm about to tell you. That was a four-year-old kid. I looked at him, he was an oriental kid, and I said, Sonny, you play baseball? And the kid, be emotional, would say, no. No? Why don't you play baseball? What do you do? I play soccer, he says. Soccer? Okay, maybe one day you play baseball again. But I still want to know, why did you quit baseball? <laughs> and the kid said, <laughs> when I'm playing baseball with my mother, she won't hit my bat. <laughs> wow. She won't hit my bat. And I looked at the kid and says, I played as a guy named Sandy Koufax, and he wouldn't hit my bat. <laughs> and what, <laughs> what I didn't know, had I met the kid prior to that, I would have thrown a temper tantrum too when Koufax would hit my bat, just to see where it worked. But that was perhaps, if I ever write a book, in that chapter be one, he wouldn't hit my bat. <laughs> he wouldn't hit my bat. And so that's what we see across the country with kids. They're excited about baseball. They still love baseball. They know a lot about baseball. Uh, surprisingly, about 55% of the audience in baseball today are women. So women nowadays know what uh, RBI is. And that's a run batted in. Uh, we had a softball game not too long ago. The Major League Baseball properties, which is the licensed division of the baseball, they had a softball game between the East and the West. And I was asked to come out and play for the East. Now, that's not a good thing to do when you quote a Hall of Famer and you size up with somebody. The other side really don't like you. So now I get to the mound to pitch a ball. I'm pitching, and they're hitting. We're making out. A lady walked up to the bat, and I stepped from the mound towards her to throw this pitch underhanded. She called time out and walked towards me. <laughs> and we met about halfway, and she said, what is this? You don't think I can hit you from the mound? <laughs> oh, ma'am, I'm sorry. Well, why did you do it? I, I'm sorry. I, I saw you were, you, you saw me with a lady, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I now got to eat crow and go back to the mound and throw the ball. So I threw the ball, and she had a line drive, and she got the first base and did that to me. I said, oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so since then, I do not make an assumption that a woman does not know what to do on a softball, football, or basketball court <laughs> uh, because they now dominate in the area of tendon sports. So where am I now? I am a Cardinals instructor, been one for the last 16 years. Came in from Jupiter, Florida. What I do in spring training, I've been I've been, uh, the, the, the title they had given Bob Gibson, Red Shingden, myself, and Arthur Smith is that we are celebrity coaches. They won't allow us to coach anyone. <laughs> but they will allow us to help, we call, uh, connect the dots. So most kids sitting in the dugout, 25 years old. Uh, my oldest son, Lou Jr., played professional football, and uh, he's 48. And they look like my grandkids. And they're saying things to me like, when you played, was the ball white? <laughs> <laughs> and you sit there, okay, okay, you guys, okay, you guys, okay, you guys. You're still trying to make the big leagues and, and, and do all those things. But that's what spring training is for us. That is what Cardinal Nation is about. As I close, let me tell you a little something about my family. Uh, as I said, I was born in Arkansas, uh, 1939. For those of you who can calculate, that's about 36 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, I am one of those players when you step up, most 
fan says he came, played in an era where they had stories, their, their career of stories. I, I never realized what they were talking about until recently when we were the kind of players who wanted to play on a team and hopefully make them champions. The whole idea during my era was to play and get to a championship and to maintain it. Everybody I know in baseball at some point or another, players, that's just a, quite a few of them, wanted to be a Yankee or a Cardinals. These are the team of Dodgers that didn't beat themselves and they were all as champions. Uh, today, there's a different player out there. Some play to be on a championship and some actually play for the money. So they don't really get off into the championship side of it. It is, can I make history by being the highest player in my position? Uh, that's a nice thing because when, you, when the dean played, we, we actually had a job. We, we played because we had a job. Somebody asked me day, the other day, how do you manage money? I said, I don't know. I had a job to pay the bills. I didn't make enough money to put into an investment where money made money. Today, you got to ask that to a younger player, and he probably will know that. But the fact is that the game has changed, and it's changed, and it's changed, and it's changed. The fans still come out, they still root and cheer. The cheer we hear on the field today, the same cheer for Dizzy Dean, Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, turn of the century, that cheer was there. It was all about baseball. Baseball has that quality about it that asks people to become kids, get into what I call the escape and get into the land, the toy land. And for that split second, that split moment, you are there. You can dream. You can actually dream. And sometimes dreams do come true. All of us, somewhere along the line, started with a dream. And it manifests itself right into your belly, into an idea that maybe this dream uh, can come true. And you begin to follow it. Follow that dream, follow that dream. And now, if you can make it happen. So every Major League Baseball player I know starts out with a dream. And his dream really is to blaze a trail that is so long, deep and wide, until it takes the next player to play better than Superman just to match you up. That is a desire, and when you get that kind of desire, can you cash in on it? Can you make it work? I had the stolen base record, 118 steal. Just before I got to 118, I had a conversation with Joe DiMaggio, and he said, Brock, if you're going to steal bases and set the record, make the last chapter one that is hard to read. What do you mean by that? They're going to have to go just to beat you. Came from Joe DiMaggio, he must be right. So I am going to stretch it out there and see what can happen. And every person who set high water marks, that is exactly what they want to do. And when you do, people begin to refer to you as the person who can shape and sway other players for generations to come to mind, a mindset about the game. And that is the beauty of baseball. Baseball had been a leading component of all time in social elements in America. And one of those social changing, when you talk about coming into a bridge where things have changed and have to change, happened in 1947. It involved a person, a player from the state of Arkansas. In the state of Arkansas, there was a pitcher named Johnny Sane. Walnut Creek, Arkansas. How many remember Johnny Sane? Johnny Sane played for Rain and Warren Spahn. I was speaking one night, and I walked past Johnny Sane's table. I was emceeing and had to introduce the ball player. And Johnny Sane says to me, hey, Brock, here's what I'd like for you to add to what you're going to say about me. 
So I said, okay, well, that wasn't a big deal. What, what do you need to add, Jenny? <clears throat> he said, and these things, it just stunned me when he said it. <clears throat> I'm the pitcher who threw the first pitch to Jackie Robinson and the last known pitch to Babe Ruth. And I made the step forward and stop. You did what? You are the man bridging history here that nobody know about? That you threw the pitch to Jackie Robinson and yet the last pitch to Babe Ruth, a man unique in himself, in that he was the player who had the ball in his hand. So I looked at Johnny and asked the question, why? His answer was, I didn't even know how he interpreted the word why, but he said, it's because I was a major league baseball player. My question in the why was, why did the ball leave your hand as a baseball, not a missile? And he said, I was a big league baseball player, baseball. I saw Yogi Berry ask the same question. I was a big league baseball player. Then I began to find out, wonder, what's a big league baseball player? I never really found the answer, but it's one where ordinary people rise to level that they are considered heroes by their, their community and put them on the shoulder and go down the street in a parade. And that is the major league baseball player. He has integrity. He means what he say, and he, at all times, the same person that you see at night in public is the same person you're going to see elsewhere. And that's what Jenny was talking about. And then in, 19, in 2000, Budweiser came out with a slogan, this program, a campaign that said, if you could talk to anybody in history, who would it be? I said, Buck O'Neill, I would like to talk to him in history, and Johnny Sane. And they looked at me and said, we know about Buck O'Neill, but why Johnny Sane? So I told him what Johnny had told me. And that day forward, we began to look into what Johnny Sane's life was all about. Uh, today, his wife, once in a while, comes out, throws out the pitch, or is mentioned on the baseball field in certain major league baseball stadium, uh, all because Johnny Sane, through baseball, was able to bring America together where the world was watching whether or not baseball would go forward or would it go backwards. And yet, Johnny was the man who had the glue. Jackie Robinson, the night before he stepped up to the plate the first time at bat, said, I need to go in early because Johnny Sane is pitching tomorrow, and he has the best curveball in baseball. The next day, Jackie Robinson hit the field. There were the cheers, and all those things took place. And guess what Johnny Sane threw him? That wicked curveball. He threw it to him four times. Jackie ground out the rest of the game. He said, if Jackie going to be a major league player, he's going to have to hit a major league curveball. Ironically, Ken Byrne, in his baseball series, when they introduced the Jackie Robinson era of baseball, look it up, there is this scene when they do that, that something viciously crossed the screen just before they bring that forward. And that is indicative of Jenny Singh curveball. That's how he become introduced. And I go, wow. So Jenny has a real impact on the game. No matter where he coached, he had 20 game winners. You know, the Mudcat Grant, the Jim Cott, the big guy over in Detroit who won 30 games. Johnny Sane was there down in Atlanta. Those 20 game winners, Johnny Sane was there. So Johnny, from the state of Arkansas, did wonders in baseball. And today, I am in the middle of trying to write a book called The Pitch. The pitch. Jenny Sane threw a pitch that started in 1947, and today there is no ending to this pitch. Nobody knows 
where he's going to wind up at. And that is Jenny saying contribution to baseball. And he was from the state of Arkansas. So that's Jenny saying. <laughs> now, how about those 67 six Cardinals? Yeah. Or was it 2011 Cardinals? <laughs> It's 2011 Cardinals. And I got to tell you, I don't know how many watch game six. <laughs> game six probably stirred up every emotion that you have. You saw the worst baseball in the first couple of innings that you ever saw. You were a little embarrassed to be a Cardinals and watching this. And then by the sixth inning, you thought, Boy, it's nice to be a Cardinals. And now by the ninth inning, when we're about to walk out and one pitch away, Bob Gibson was with us, and he says to my wife and I, the fat lady is singing, and I'm getting out of here. <laughs> he said, Bob, the game is not over. He said, I don't care. The fat lady's on her way to the stage. So Jackie says, my wife says, there would be no fat lady singing tonight. <laughs> and so Bob said, I'm not going to be around no matter what you say. And so when Freeze hit this ball to win, Bob and all those guys are in that hotel room. <laughs> and I said, boy, boy, little faith that you guys have. <laughs> little faith that you have. But game six. As we were, Hall of Fame was throwing out the first pitch, I think Red Sheen and I, we walked, we had two choices going on the field. One through the gates where everybody were in a big crowd, and it was a big crowd. Or we could go in the clubhouse and walk out through the dugout. My wife, Jack, and I chose to walk through the dugout. And the only player we saw on the way to the dugout was David Fries. And now we exchanged pleasantry, and I said to him, this is it, man, the big game tonight. It's do or die. Only advice I got for you is see the ball, hit ball. No other thing thought do you have. See ball, hit ball. And folks, he did. <laughs> He did, to the degree that every emotion that we have was touched. One o'clock in the morning, we leave the stadium. And the next night, game seven, I am scheduled to be in Little Rock, Arkansas, 600 people waiting, American Diabetes Association. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Everybody said, you can't go. You got to stay for game seven. I said, Listen, I gave my word. I got to be there. I got to be there. So I came into Little Rock, and I got here by 12 noon, and I didn't call the director until about 2 o'clock in the evening. Ma'am, this is Lou Brock. She didn't even say hi. The question was, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? And I said, Little Rock. She said, oh, great. She said, everybody was saying you weren't going to show up. I said, them, I sometimes have to keep my word, but this is a tough one. <laughs> this is a tough one. So I actually saw Game 7 from a restaurant, and uh, it was a very delight. My wife was texting me every second about what was going on. But nevertheless, we did it. We did it. And prior to the World Series, Game one, we, my wife and I, was on the Today Show. And they had the trophy, baseball trophy, sitting up front. Matt Lowry and all those people was talking about it. They had a representative from the Rangers and one for the card, which was I. And they want to know what would this trophy mean to each one of us. Matt William, not Mitch William, from the Texas Rangers said, boy, this would be great to be in Texas. And we can now show it and raise funds for the person who uh, had the unfortunate accident in the stadium. 
I mean, that was a lot of pressure because now they turn to me and say, what does it mean to you? I said, well, we, we like to do the same thing with the trophy, help Texie out. But we really, trophy belonged to us. <laughs> 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 they go, why does it belong to you? I said, the St. Louis Cardinals, of course, they're the team. Only the Yankees have won more World Series. And this is a step closer to the Yankees. And the Yankees have won 26 World Series. In fact, they have only won about 12 or 13. They bought the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they really wasn't too far in front of us. And so as a consequence, uh, the trophy did come to St. Louis. The, our logo and everything was put on it, the world champions. And the fact is that, that the stadium, and I'll share this with you and then I'll close, is that our executive on the Cardinals had a real hard time game six. The traditional champagne bath, Texas Rangers, Hamilton hits the home run. And now the champagne go across the stadium to this side of the stadium. <laughs> Berkman get the hit, the champagne came back to this side of the stadium. <laughs> so they had this champagne going back and forth, back and forth, saying, what? who's going to do this thing? And they were really putting pressure on a lot of people who were trying to make this happen. Then David Free walked up and ended that nightmare uh, with, with the big home run. And the next night, it was all history. Uh, the Cardinal did what they had to do, and that is to become a champion. So tonight, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you and to celebrate, and not only to celebrate the championship, but to celebrate this marriage between Little Rock and the Cardinal with the museum. I really want you to go and take a good look at it. It is about Cardinal history. It is about those things that can make us proud and is also those things that give us bragging rights about your team. Bragging rights. My team. Yeah. Yeah. My team. <laughs> so my wife always told me if you're going to make a speech, just make it like a good lawn. Keep it short. <laughs> Keep it short. So tonight, I hope I kept it short for you. I hope I shared some moments that in your life and history and done all these things. But before I sit down, I have a very special friend in the audience. We were in high school together, played on the same baseball team. Uh, he thought he was the manager and should be the coach. I thought I should have been the manager and the coach. And the two of us, he played center field, I played some left field, first base, and pitched a little bit. But he was the glue of our team, the smallest guy on the team. He's here tonight. He lives in this Little Rock. He's a minister. So meet and greet my friend, Reverend Lemmy Downs, and his wife. <laughs> Last but not least, I, I started to tell you about my family and stop, but I will tell you anyway. Uh, I am married, blended family. We have five kids, uh, two girls, three boys. One of the boys, Lou Jr., played in the NFL for three years. Uh, he was a small guy, weighed 170 pounds, and he wanted to play football. And I said, you can't play football at 170 pounds. So he did. <laughs> so he did. So why do you want to play football? I want to go to the West Coast and play in the Rose Bowl game. He went out to USC, 1984, he's in the Rose Bowl game. They played Ohio State, 
And Ohio State had a running back named Keith Bias. I mean, I heard that name. That was the biggest man I had ever seen. <laughs> Keith Bias stood about 6'4", weighed about 260 pounds. And when he got the football in his hand, and he was tackled by someone, especially one guy. When one guy hit him, it was as though nobody hit him. My son's assignment was, if Keith Bias break a loose, Lou Jr., you got to stop him. So I'm looking at this mismatch. I'm sitting in the stand. Lou Jr. knew exactly where I was. Every kick off, hey, Dad. And I go, oh, no, no. It's the freight train that's coming you better be hey, Dad, about. <laughs> And I was sitting there as a father trying to figure out, was my insurance paid up? <laughs> so that's what I had. So now he came home at the end of the, the school session. I got a nine-year-old sitting there. Big brother walked in the door, no socks, January. Nine-year-old said, oh, big brother, no socks, January. He's, you don't have to wear socks on the West Coast. Nine-year-old, I'm going to the West Coast. I'm going to do like Big Brother. So a few years later, he's now on the West Coast. And in 1996, my second son is now playing in the Rose Bowl game. And he's playing Wisconsin. Emory is his name. Talk to Emory. What is your assignment today? Well, I'm the guy who has to stop, you know, that big running back they got in Wisconsin. The big running back named Ron Dane, and he was bigger than Keith Bias. <laughs> and as a father, I'm going, oh, no, check my insurance, please, <laughs> because this, this ain't going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. Uh, but my son both survived it, and so my wife and I now can live and talk about it and laugh about it. But I got to tell you, as a father, so those of you who've been in Little League, college ball, high school ball, wherever you've been as a father, you know your heart go out to your kids. And when they get assignment that big, you really don't want to see the collision. <laughs> so having said all of that, it's been a treat for me and my wife to be here. Thank you for the invite. We look forward to coming back, and we hope that this museum, this partnership, is the best you're ever going to see. And we've been at a lot of them but this seemed to be the right marriage. So thank you very much for listening to me. I think we um, have just time for maybe one or two questions uh, before we let you all loose on. <laughs> okay, well, how about if we do this? How about if we try to have a little organization around the questions? <laughs> just a tad. So what is your question? And do we have mics? Okay. Your question, sir. He's got one for you here. I want to know how Pujols could take so little more money and leave the Cardinals. Mr. Dean, you want to answer that question? <laughs> you know, you never know what contracts are drawn up and how they're worded. I remember when Diaz won 30 games in 1934, and he and my dad won two games each in the World Series. That year, Diaz made $15,000. And in 35, he won another 28 games. So when he got his contract for the 36th season, they sent him a contract with a $5,000 a year cut. So he sent that back, and of course they held out. But who knows what happened? You know, only Pujols and the Cardinal organization know what happened. And uh, I wish him well, but I think the Cardinals will sure win their division this year. And uh, that's all we can do is go forward. Thank you. Uh, okay, how about let, let one me, more? Let me come in on that as well. Oh, okay. Uh, Not yet? The fact is that uh, Albert, 
really wanted to be a Cardinal, and I'm sure of that, but circumstances, as I said earlier, there are ball players in the game today who um, play to win, and there are those who play to win, but somewhere along the line, there's a soft spot where when you offer $250,000 guaranteed, I think I would have saddled up my horse too. <laughs> Saying that is good or bad, I don't know. But, you, <laughs> but only once in life does that come. So it's a chance he had to take, and he did. And so he's not here anymore, so therefore we got a good team. I think uh, Carlos Beltran is going to be outstanding. And you're not going to, you're going to miss the Abbott, but this ball club is going to be competitive all the way. Okay, how about one more? Okay. Uh, Lou, what is your, a nice jacket, by the way. What is your uh, opinion of the National League adopting the designated hitter rule? The question was whether my opinion of the National League adopting the designated hitter rules. I think it's un American. <laughs> And I said that simply because, you know, in the American League, the pitchers didn't hit. Can you imagine a guy like Cliff Lee, who had been in the American League all that time? He had played his entire career there. And he retires. He become a grandfather. The kids sit on his knee and say, Granddad, tell me what it's like to hit a baseball in Major League Baseball. <laughs> and Cliff would have said, hit? <laughs> we didn't bat. <laughs> I, I just think it's, it's not baseball because... High school, college ball, your know, greatest athlete are uh, the pitchers. These are guys who can hit, can do just about everything. And I just think it's not fair to play Major League Baseball and don't go to bat. Well, I don't know about you, but do you think it's time we let them go see it? Yeah. I'm going to invite you to go see the museum. You know what I suggest we do? We just yell, play ball. What do you think? <laughs> the exhibit is in the, on the third floor in the temporary gallery. Both doors are open. I know everybody's going to want to go all at the same time. So remember, there's an elevator and an escalator. The rest of the museum is open as well if you'd like, but I'm betting that's not what you're here for. Uh, remember, you can also buy season tickets this year. We're trying a new, a, a, a new sort of marketing tool that if you buy one of these season tickets, you can come back to see the exhibit as many times as you want with that season ticket. So enjoy it. We are very proud. We thank you so very much. We thank your wife, my dear. And we are very proud of this exhibit. Thank you, Cardinals. <laughs> that was fun. And where's Fred? Fred, are you going to be able to help us here direct the every? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. OK, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Play ball. <laughs> Are you going to be able to help us here direct the every? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Okay, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Play ball. 